Welcome to the second St. Baldrick's Foundation LinkedIn Live Impact Series, the live stream that helps gives kids a lifetime. My name is Kathleen Ruddy. I'm the CEO of the St. Baldrick's Foundation, and you're in for a fascinating 30 minutes as my distinguished guest today is Dr. Ned Sharpless, Director of the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Sharpless was sworn in as the 15th Director of the NCI in October of 2017. He also served as acting commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for seven months in 2019 before returning to the NCI directorship. An accomplished researcher, Dr. Sharpless has authored more than 160 original scientific papers, reviews, and book chapters, and he's the inventor on 12 patents. Dr. Sharpless is here to talk about federal investments in childhood cancer research and how the NCI advances treatment for children with cancer. Welcome, Dr. Sharpless. Great. Thank you for having me today. Uh, you know, it's wonderful to be speaking with you. St. Baldrick's has been such a tremendous ally uh, of the National Cancer Institute on this problem. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And there's so much important work going on. I'm eager to share it with our audience. Uh, as the largest non-government funder of child and cancer research grants, as well as a leader in child and cancer advocacy, St. Baldrick's Foundation has a deep interest in the work the NCI is doing. And we really see that our mission and yours go hand in hand. So please, Dr. Sharpless, tell us about the child and cancer portfolio at the NCI and um, how research from basic science to clinical trials is impacting kids with cancer. Yeah, the, the NCI is a very large and diverse portfolio related to childhood cancer. It's a, a number of very important activities that range from very, very basic science all the way through clinical trials and survivorship research. And it, it really covers a waterfront of very important activities. Some of those things are intramural in the NCI intramural program using the scientists, uh, you know, say Frederick and Bethesda, but uh, most of it really is extramural funding to investigators at top academic centers throughout the country. Uh, and, 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 and importantly, a lot of the real basic investigation that provide the discoveries, you know, in new immunotherapy or new understanding of cancer that allow for new treatments that, that move the needle for all patients with cancer, those happen generally in the extramural community uh, through, uh, you know, our, our, this investigator initiated pool of funds that we supply. We also have some collaborative networks for clinical trials. So we have the Children's Oncology Group uh, is a clinical, one of the, the largest and most important clinical trials network related to pediatric cancer. But others like the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium and some investigator initiated trials that we support. And then the uh, Cancer Moonshot, uh, uh, you know, is we're in year five of the Moonshot and that has a number of very important uh, specific focuses on pediatric cancer, including fusion oncoproteins, patient engagement networks to really try and bring patients uh, particularly patients with rare diseases to the NCI for clinical trials, and then also a pediatric immuno-oncology drug discovery network. So it's really a, a wide variety of important topics. It's a vibrant research portfolio and one that is continually growing. It certainly sounds like it. And I'm aware that the NCI is one of the main funders in the, in the world and certainly in the country of basic science. How does basic science um, what role does it play in making translational science and or translational research and clinical trials possible? Yeah, I, I, you know, I've been a uh, uh, worked in this space of taking basic investigations into in, into clinical translation my entire career, and it it really is important. It's not well understood how important that first step is. If, if you don't have an understanding of the biomedical problem you're trying to address. The ability to do anything about it is very limited. And so often, sometimes we, we focus a lot on uh, clinical trials. That makes sense when the opportunity exists, but that opportunity is always predicated by a real basic science understanding of um, uh, the problem you're trying to study. The, the thing about basic science is, though, that it, 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 it's not often we start out working in one area thinking we're working on, you know, RAS signaling or something and end up working, you know, making a discovery that's relevant to another area. So you know, some of the most foundational and important discoveries in cancer research may come from very unexpected places. It's hard to say, you know, this is the grant that's going to cure cancer. It's, it's much more um, an, an unknown, unknown area we're working in. But it has been a very good investment. I think we're, the extraordinary progress we're seeing in, in cancer outcomes, you know, every, every year now we see these you know, striking drops in cancer mortality, for example, uh, that, that reflects these decades of investment in elegant and you know, very meticulous basic science investigation. So it's very, very important for all kinds of cancer, including pediatric cancer. And so the basic science really makes the translational science possible where 
and I'm probably giving this a very simplistic explanation as a layperson, but where you translate findings in the lab into patients and then later into clinical trials where you actually have something and you're testing it for a more of a large scale efficacy, right? And right. you don't get one without the work that preceded it. Right. That, that, that's exactly right. The, uh, you know, the, the first step is important. Without that, the rest of the process is much more, uh, much less likely to work. And, and we know that, you know, in the, in the early days of oncology, we tried lots of therapies without a good understanding of what we were, you know, the biology of the tumor and, and the success rates of those trials were much lower. And now in the modern era where we're starting to understand, you know, what makes a cancer tick, what really drives that tumor and, and, and provide drugs and therapies specifically against those processes, our success rates are much higher. And so this is uh, really important for patients. Uh, they get access to better clinical trials earlier that have a better chance of helping them. Each year, federal funding for childhood cancer research is at the top of our policy agenda. Um, while research for many other diseases is principally funded by sources other than the government, such as nonprofits, academia, and the pharmaceutical industry, Childhood cancer research really uniquely depends on the federal government and the NCI as its primary source of funding. Um, and we know that in recent years, that funding has increased and it, that's enabled a lot of change. And I think it, the funding at NCI has roughly doubled for pediatric cancer research in recent years. Tell us about that impact and what you're doing with those new dollars. Right, well, I, I would say, uh, you know, uh, federal funding for pediatric cancer is one of my top priorities too. So we we agree on that. I, I think it's um, it really is very very important progress in this field. The, the the challenge we have at the NCI, I think we'd be frank about it, is that um, it's a, it, it's a good problem to have. It's it's such sort of an extraordinary time in cancer research. There's so many new approaches and new ideas and and people coming to this field that we've seen this dramatic increase in applications for for funding to the National Cancer Institute. And we have reason to believe that the pandemic period may even make that worse for a variety of reasons. So you know, there's this intense competition for funding uh, because there's so many new ideas. I think a lot of new scientists are coming to cancer research with and bringing these, these new approaches and ideas, which is in general, I think, good for progress and good for patients. But it is um, does provide this issue that um, funding uh, can be very competitive. And, and that, is, that had caused our pay lines, you know, the the sort of number we use to decide what grants we're going to pay to drop to an untenable level. And I think that was very dangerous for uh, particularly new investigators to the field. New scientists coming into research would be turned off by very low pay lines and would decide they, you know, the cancer research career is not really what was for them, including in pediatric cancer. Uh, the last few years, we've dedicated a lot of funding to try and lift those pay lines. In fact, Congress asked us to do that. They, they gave a specific language asking us to try and raise pay lines. Happily, they, they, you know, we went from as low as 8% up to 10% last year, and it looks like this year we'll be able to get up to 11%. And our goal is to get up to 15% by 2025. That will raise all boats, and particularly in this basic science area where it's not clear if the discovery is really targeted to this kind of cancer, that kind of cancer. Um, and, and that will be really important, we think, for progress in all areas. Uh, but we also think that um, in childhood cancer, there's specific, really specific opportunities uh, related to, you know, changes in how we do clinical trials and new discoveries, uh, the usage of data, you know, the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, for example, has been a, a, a big deal and, and, and I think brings some new capabilities to the problem. I already mentioned the Moonshot Initiative. So I, I think that, um, you know, those have been major focuses of the new funding. And I also think that uh, there's been a particular interest in survivorship research. So this is a real problem in pediatric oncology where we see uh, sometimes uh, beneficial therapies that will cure a patient, but the, uh, with very significant toxicity that may uh, last the rest of the patient's life, you know, uh, significant surgeries and the toxicities related to radiation and chemotherapy. And so a very vibrant survivorship portfolio research is really, really important to the NCI too. And uh, this is someone where we've brought in new leadership now, Emily Tonarezos, to run our survivorship office, and also have had interest from Congress through the STAR Act, which is an area where we've uh, really tried to, uh, you know, address the concerns of Congress related to survivorship. So those are a few examples of the important things we've used the new funding for. 
Well, I, I certainly understand the pressures that you must be feeling because certainly organizations like St. Baldrick's have been heavily impacted by um, COVID. Um, our inability to hold special events, for example, wiped out approximately a third of our revenue last year. And that was reflected in the grants and certainly everything else we do at the foundation. So we understand and expect that, yes, more of those researchers who would have been likely to come to us will be coming to you. So thank you for in advance to your team for taking that on. But I'm also thrilled to hear that there is such a concentration of support for survivorship research. I think that's an area where, <clears throat> pardon me, many people don't really understand the importance because for so many, the first goal is for their child to survive, obviously. But once they survive, what quality of life do they have? Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the reasons why survivorship research is so important? Because many in our audience may not be aware of the lifelong challenges child cancer survivors live with. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. You know, I, and I have to say, you know, my uh, the way I came to this is a medical oncologist in adult oncology, where survivorship is a very important topic. Uh, we talk about it a lot. We worry about it a lot. But if you're talking about older individuals who are survivors of, say, prostate cancer, right? You know, survivorship is not um, the big deal in adult oncology that I found it to be in pediatric oncology for just the reasons you mentioned. I mean, we're really talking about affecting someone's quality of life uh, forever for, for their entire, uh, you know, set from childhood on. And, uh, and you know, the good news is, is some of these cancers we can now cure with very aggressive therapy and surgery, radiation and chemotherapy. But all of those things have a, a significant toxicity and decrease the quality of life going forward. And so uh, I think this is an area where there's really in interesting scientific opportunity on understanding why, you know, what causes these long-term toxicities and how, how can we address them and ameliorate them? Or can we reduce therapy, you know, dose escalate in the initial treatment period? So there are interesting clinical research questions as well there. And so I, I think this is exactly... And, and by the way, it's really important to mention, this is not something that industry is likely to pay for. That generally, you know, de-escalation and long-term toxicity studies, that's a really good fit for the National Cancer Institute and something we should be doing. And, 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 and as I mentioned, uh, Congress was interested in this too. So, you know, there's broad bipartisan support for survivorship research in, in childhood cancer in Congress. And that culminated in the STAR Act, which is, you know, asked the NCI to take on several activities related to pediatric uh, cancer survivorship research, including tissue acquisition, you know, biobankings and biospecimen studies, and then a number of new funding initiatives related to survivorship. And so we, we in 2020 and, and, and in 2019, we added new funding initiatives related to pediatric, uh, to young children with cancer and adult and young adolescent and young adult cancer survivorship. Uh, and both of those have made several awards. We fund a long ongoing childhood cancer stu survivor study that you know is one of the you know, largest, largest longitudinal studies of this topic. And we anticipate making more uh, awards and, and, and doing more in this area in 2021 and on, because I think this is, uh, as mentioned, a very important topic in pediatric cancer research and a really uh, important place for the NCI to show leadership. In my work, Dr. Sharpless, I'm often asked, why is it that um, chemo uh, therapy, surgery, and radiation have such a different impact on kids than on adult cancer patients? And I my simple explanation is that kids' bodies and minds are still developing. So when you cut, burn, or poison them, essentially, to kill the cancer, you are creating scars that last a lifetime. And if you are a survivor of childhood cancer, but you're infertile, or you have horrendous heart disease, or other cancers, or you have cognitive impairment, you don't have the quality of life that we all want for that child now an adult they may be alive but they don't have all the abilities um preserved that other patients do T totally agree and this is where i think um both you know basic science of why these toxicities occur and why the better ways to treat these cancers and then very important clinical research of you know de-escalating therapy initially and, and other kinds of approaches are, are really important and then lastly we, we really I think have been surprised. We really need the long-term longitudinal studies, which are hard to do and they're expensive and uh, they're challenging studies to do, but they're very, very important because you see that, you know, some agents that are, are, are very similar in terms of their ability to treat a cancer, uh, you know, at the time of the cancer can have wildly different long-term toxicities when studied over years and decades. 
So this is uh, the kind of research we need to do. It's it's difficult research to do, but it's very, very important. And I, I think, um, you know, this is, as, as mentioned, a place where the NCI is uh, well poised to, uh, you know, provide some of the uh, support for those trials. Uh, this is also one of the uh, real goals of the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative is to allow, you know, a collection of data on patients that may serve some of those longitudinal data collecting functions as well. You know, that, that, that may be a, an, an, an outcome of the CCDI that will be benefit, beneficial, I think. Hmm. I certainly hope so. Um, if you're just joining us, this is the St. Baldrick's Foundation LinkedIn Live Impact Series. We're visiting with Dr. Ned Sharpless, Director of the National Cancer Institute, to learn how federal investments in childhood cancer research help children with cancer. Dr. Sharpless, a little over two years ago, the childhood cancer community had a big policy win um, with the passage of the Childhood Cancer Star Act. It was the most comprehensive childhood cancer bill in history. I'm proud to say the St. Baldrick's Foundation authored it and our advocates were instrumental in getting that passed. And just last month, Congress appropriated $30 million to fully fund the programs of the Star Act for the third straight year. How is, what is, explain the role that the NCI is playing in implementing it and up, please update us on how the work is going and what we're achieving. Right, thank you. Uh, as mentioned, it, I think it's a testament to the real broad bipartisan support of the interest in this topic. Um, the STAR Act asked the NCI to do a couple of things. So it asked the NCI to focus on biospecimen collection, you know, getting samples of tumors from patients, which are very important for these longitudinal studies uh, and molecular subtyping and, and, and these sorts of things. And uh, this, so the NCI is working with the Children's Oncology Group, really uh, launched a very uh, uh, a dedicated biospecimen collection program with a focus on rare cancer subtypes to make sure that uh, NCI supported biorepositories contain those kinds of patients' uh, material as well as uh, from certain, you know, underrepresented populations and other, uh, other vulnerable populations in pediatric cancer research. The STAR Act also asks us to, to really focus on these kinds of clinical studies that I mentioned or, or translational studies that focus on uh, survivorship itself in pediatric cancer and uh, adolescent young adult populations with cancer. And uh, so that we've done in a number of ways. This includes new funding announcements, so uh, so-called RFAs, these requests for abstracts for um, outcomes research and survivorship research in the AYA population and in the uh, and in, in, in true younger children with cancer population as well. Both of, both of those have made some awards. So we've had a, a U01 network, a cooperative agreement network for survivorship research awarded in uh, 2019 and 2020. And then uh, also uh, a new funding opportunity in 2020 for other kinds of grants, these so-called R01s for uh, research to reduce morbidity and, imp and improve care for pediatric and AYA patients. And, and their subsequent survivorship. And that will be, those awards should be made this summer. And uh, as mentioned, we have an ongoing commitment to many important initiatives in this area, like the Childhood Cancer Survivor st Study. So I think th this area of research, which um, I think you're right, you know, initially there was a, 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 an emphasis on, you know, just helping the child survive, just finding the treatment to the cure. But now that we've made some progress for many children with cancer, we still have a ways to go with certain, certain types of childhood cancer. But now, in, in many instances, we're able to cure children. But really, the question is at what cost and how can we minimize those toxicities and maximize their, their quality of life uh, going forward? You know, we talk about cancers all the time as if they're all the same. And in the adult world, there are cancers that are not rare. They are not or not rare diseases. They breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. They're so proliferant that... Um, that you, they're almost commonplace, unfortunately, today. But every childhood cancer is statistically considered rare. And so it, it really requires that we use every asset, if you will, in a very efficient way. So we really um, were excited about the provision of the STAR Act, which you mentioned, which was biorepositories, making sure that we are cataloging and tracing tissues and, and that researchers would have access to those samples so that they could accelerate the pace of their research because there aren't as many patients to work with, right? In pediatric. Yeah. To totally agree. And pediatric cancer provides some challenges for clinical research because, you know, the, the traditional paradigm of clinical trials is to have, you know, lots of patients in RMA and lots of patients in RMB and give them slightly different therapies and see who does better. And 
that is uh, that's doable. You know, that's becoming challenging, frankly, even in adult oncology, where we're now focusing on smaller and smaller, you know, molecularly defined subtypes of cancer. But that's always been quite difficult to do in childhood cancers, which are, are much more rare than than the uh, common solid tumors of adults that you mentioned. So, uh, you know, we, what we, what the NCI feels like we need to do in this instance is really learn from every patient, is to be very, very efficient and try and maximally collect data from every child with cancer such that we can learn uh, from their entire treatment course. So going from diagnosis all the way uh, throughout the history of that, that patient's care, uh, that's a difficult thing to do because the way care is given, it may be fragmented, it may be in multiple hospitals, it may be you know, over a considerable period of time. And, and um, but we think that by learning from every patient, by getting information out of every child with cancer, we really can help decide how to treat all children better with cancer. So this really was the rationale for the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, you know, a new, uh, uh, a, a new uh, program funded by Congress starting really last year. We're, we're just beginning year two of this. Uh, this provides $50 million of funding per year for uh, the, the project times 10 years. The idea is a 10-year program to try and better organize and aggregate childhood cancer data and then provide it to researchers so that we can make progress for all children with cancer. And, and that, th this, uh, I think the two activities of the STAR Act and the CCDI are highly complementary. You know, they have, they have related focuses and they, they, they support each other. And I, I think this is a really good um, way to link those two efforts. I also think that the CCDI, for example, builds on other prior initiatives like Project Every Child that we had in the Children's Oncology Group that was already trying to collect material on all children treated in, in that network, for example. So we, we believe that, um, you know, these, these, the, these frameworks together will really allow us to understand how, uh, you know, children uh, are diagnosed with cancer, are treated with cancer, then are followed uh, longitudinally for um survivorship issues and as well going forward. And uh, by doing all these things in a combined way, we think we can learn uh, what we need to know about the outcomes of all children with cancer and do this in a way that is um, slightly different from a traditional clinical trial. It you know, doesn't involve uh, you know, some of the, we, we still do a lot of clinical trials and always will in pediatric cancer, but this allows us to get more information that we were missing for the patients that weren't enrolled on clinical trials, or maybe we're only enrolled for a clinical trial for the beginning of their treatment, but the later part of their care or, you know, was not on a clinical trial, for example. So, you know, by trying to really get other interesting new sources of data, we believe we can really build out that data set and, and better understand how to treat childhood cancer. You know, in this era of big data, I think everybody kind of assumes that all of this data is aggregated or and available to researchers, but it's really rather siloed. And that was part of the impetus for this this program, right? And so how do you feel like this is going to either accelerate or change the way the NCI supports research going forward? Right. You, you are correct. The, um, the, the data, uh, for a variety of reasons that you would want to know about someone's outcome treated with cancer are uh, often less available and harder to work with than we would like. They may be in different, different, different medical systems. There are different types of data. And then there's an issue of consent that you you know to, to generally you need patients' consent to look at their data and use it for, use it for research. Uh, so uh, you know the, the CCDI is really uh, trying to figure out how to solve those data siloing problems in a way that is uh, best for research. You know extracts maximal information to be used for progress, but at the same time still protects patient privacy and patient anonymity and honors the important uh, tenet of patient consent. So um, we think we can do that. We think now uh, through a variety of approaches, we can um, aggregate data from different sets, uh, anonymize those data if need be, uh, or you know, pull already de-identified data, for example, add that with clinical trials data that we're already collecting, say in the children's oncology group or in other clinical trials we, we, we fund, use other sources of data, you know, like payer claims data and whatnot, put all of that together in a way that is in a common data infrastructure that then can be used for um, researchers uh, to uh, say, you know, does this sort of genetic event correlate with worse outcome years later for this specific kind of cancer? You know, those kinds of things that I think the general public would think we were already able to do today. We're really not able to do that today unless we're talking about patients that are in a specific clinical trial. 
Uh, one of the reasons I'm very excited about the CCDI is that um, this is a huge problem in oncology research for all kinds of cancer. And if we and, 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 and taking this on in childhood cancer is the right size problem. It's you know thousands of patients a year. It's a significant large problem, but it's not you know uh, lung cancer, which is you know two hundred thousand cases a year, for example. So I, I think that um, what we learn from the CCDI on how to aggregate data and use data in these novel settings will, I think, inform all of cancer research. It's nice to see because you know for, for for years we we would work in adult oncology and try and move the discovery to kids later. In this instance, we're going the other direction. We're starting out with children, and what we learn from working in the pediatric population, I hope will benefit the entire cancer research community, and I fully expect it will. And, and already, you know, the CCDI is off to a great start. We've had a lot, you know, very tremendous enthusiasm for the, from the, the community. There are a number of researchers do this on their own, and so re they really need the NCI's help to sort of bring them together and convene and pro provide some funding. But it's a really fertile ground on which to, you know, get started because there, there is tremendous excitement in this area already out there in the field. That is exciting to hear because I and I hadn't thought of it in that way before that this could also be, you know, a pilot for adult cancers. And the pediatric research world has been very adept and accustomed to collaboration, but this could really um, spark further collaboration in adult research too. I love things when you can get um, multiple benefits for one investment. That's extraordinary. Right. Yeah, this, this siloing is not unique to pediatric cancer. And so if we can solve this problem in this population, I, I think we will be able to reproduce it in other populations as well. Absolutely. Well, at the St. Baldrick's Foundation, we have a wonderful group of advocates, many of whom you've met, and they're in our Speak Up for Kids Cancer Network. St. Baldrick's is also the co-chair of the Alliance for Childhood Cancer, which is a coalition of patient advocacy groups, healthcare professional societies, and scientific organizations, all with a vested interest in childhood cancer policy. So in this era where we have a changing administration, an administration that um, has roots in the moonshot, the cancer moonshot, which you mentioned, how can advocates um, be the most effective partner for the NCI at this time? Right. Well, you know, I think it's a it's a very interesting time for cancer advocacy. Uh, you know, there's a new administration, one with a very demonstrated and strong commitment to cancer research and an interest in cancer outcomes. And I, I think this will be a receptive administration to hear about the needs for cancer research funding. But we also have this global pandemic going on that has really disrupted cancer research and training for cancer researchers in a very dramatic way. And there is discussion in Congress about, you know, should there be additional supplementary funding to the NIH to uh, support, to try and support some of these researchers through this period, uh, you know, in, in say a, an additional stu supplement bill. We've already had, I don't know, six supplements, so maybe a seventh one uh, sometime in 2021. That would be uh, uh, very welcome news to the NIH, which is you know, has a number of important research pro programs and training initiatives that have been significantly disrupted by the pandemic, and we need, uh, you know, funds to make up some of those studies. Clinical trials alone, we've seen a, a very dramatic effect of the pandemic on accrual to clinical trials. You know, the numbers of patients that go on these trials has really slowed down during the pandemic, and, and that's concerning because that means the trials take longer and become more expensive, and it, it's a longer period before that useful information it leads to, you know, approval of a new therapy, for example. So, you know, making up clinical trials would be an important uh, part thing to be talking about and, and will require additional funding. But, you know, what we really want to do is get back to that period of remarkable progress in cancer where we were seeing, you know, maybe you saw in the Wall Street Journal this announcement of the biggest drop in cancer mortality, uh, you know, ACS's new report that came out yesterday of 2.4%, and that's on 2.2% 2, 2 .2 the prior year. So, you know, we want to get back to that trend of steady decline in cancer mortality and, and really capitalize on these great investments and in infrastructure that we built over the years for cancer research. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I think we discussed how to do that, you know, the support for the extramural pool and for clinical trials and for, you know, the 15% pay line initiative. Uh, and then all of this, by the way, happens. A, a third interesting event going on right now is that we're really in the 50th anniversary, 50th year anniversary of the National Cancer Act. So in 1971, President Nixon signed the National Cancer Act, which did a number of really important things for cancer research in the United States, including more funding for the NCI. And um, it really made cancer, uh, destigmatized cancer. It made it something that we could talk about, frankly, as, and, and not a disease that was, you know, uttered about in hushed tones, for example. But the other thing the NCI did is it provided a bunch of research infrastructure for the National Cancer Institute, like Frederick National Lab and the SEER database and the Cancer Center program, some really important things. And so 
2021, we'll also be talking about that. We'll be talking about how, you know, five decades of cancer research has gotten us to where we are with some really remarkable progress, particularly in the last decade or two, but still a long way to go. You know, many, uh, many patients who have unacceptable outcomes with cancer, they are, we don't cure enough patients, and then also patients where we do cure them, but the survivorship challenges are still very formidable. So we, we have a lot of areas where we need uh, focused, continued research. And I think, you know, it's up to advocacy to, you know, the pandemic, the change of administration and the National Cancer Act. It's, it's a lot to integrate and, 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 uh, and try and talk about. But the good news is, I think that, uh, you know, when I go down to the to Capitol, everybody on both sides of the aisle is interested in talking about the NCI and, and our work, in particular, our work in pediatric cancer. So there's a very a willing audience for our work and, and, and broad bipartisan support for what we're trying to do. I'm often asked, what was the survival rate for children with cancer when St. Baldrick started and what is it now? And the answers are 79% and 84%. And so that took 20 years to achieve over that time. So the 2.2% increase in survivorship in overall cancers that you mentioned um, that's just come out is significant in one year. I know that when you translate it to lives and it's the life of a loved one on the line, it's not fast enough, but in scientific terms, that is huge. And you've just outlined a whole bunch of opportunities for advocates to work with the NCI to kind of make the case for more support and, and tap all the opportunities you've just described. Would the NCI be willing to participate with us in um, upcoming virtual events with the pediatric community, such as Child of Cancer Action Days? Sure. No, we, we um, you know, uh, there is this caveat of what federal officials can, uh, you know, can, can do. But yes, we would be very interested in uh, helping with this messaging. And, and by the way, we, we definitely envision the conversation around the National Cancer Act as not really being NCI led, but really the community talking about that important anniversary and, and, and using it as an opportunity to talk about the opportunities for future progress in cancer research. And, uh, you know, we very much hope that uh, groups like St. Baldrick's will you know, take up that theme and, and use that uh, that moment in history to, you know, just to further press the need for more support for cancer research. And, and the NCI is eager to support the advocacy community uh, in those uh, in those efforts. Well, thank you for that. It's It's been a fascinating half an hour to be able to spend with you. Um, it's a rare opportunity to get this kind of insight from the top of the cancer world. Um, NCI really is the bedrock of research for child of cancer patients. Um, the investment in child of cancer research, it's exciting that it has nearly doubled in recent years, and that's a trend we want to continue. Um, the Child of Cancer Star Act and Data Initiative sound like they're making really meaningful progress and are really going to catapult the pace of progress. We're thrilled to hear that is going well. And um, we're excited that with the Cancer Moonshot, we'll have new opportunities to revisit provisions and findings and recommendations that were made through that important process as well. So um, I thank you for your um, partnership with the child of cancer community. Dr. Sharpless, you have been a great leader and we thank you for updating us on the important work today. And please thank everybody at the NCI. And I wanna give a shout out to all the researchers around the country who are hard at work for kids with cancer. If you and our audience would like to learn more about child of cancer research or become an advocate for children with cancer, you can ensure your voice is heard in Washington by joining our Speak Up Network by visiting stbaldricks.org slash advocacy. Thank you all and thanks to Dr. Sharpless for joining us today and for helping to give kids a lifetime. Thank you for having me. <laughs>